OK, good morning. Uh, today's lecture will mostly be about Turing machines. So last time we got started in the how to formalize computation so that we can study the computational complexity of algorithms. And this is the little picture of what goes on. You have an input and an output, and the output's produced by an algorithm. So uh, last time we talked about encoding mathematical objects as strings. So we saw that you can you know, encode pretty much anything as a string. So in this picture, you know, the input and the output are both going to be strings over some alphabet called sigma, usually 0 and 1, but it can be anything. And uh, eventually today, we're mainly going to talk about in, uh, how to define an algorithm using Turing machines or something else. Um, but uh, there's something in between that we talked about also last time, which is what you actually want your algorithm to do, which is solve problems. And I'll remind you a little bit about that. We're going to make one more definition. Uh, so last time I distinguished between three kinds of problems that you might want to solve with an algorithm. Decision problems and function problems. And search problems. Okay, so decision problems were the sort of most simple concept. This is ones where the output is supposed to just be yes or no. Okay, see so these are problems that take an input, which is a string, and the output is supposed to either be no or yes. Okay, which sometimes we call zero or one, or reject, accept. Okay, this is yes, no questions. And function problems are one where the input is a string and the output is also a string. And for every input, there's like one correct output answer that the algorithm is supposed to figure out. And search problems have an input which is a string and an output which is a string, but there are potentially zero correct answers or multiple correct answers. Okay, and usually the algorithm has to output any correct answer or report that there is no correct answer. And as I said towards the, the last class, uh, the end of last class, mostly, at least when we're making definitions, we're going to focus on decision problems. And it's kind of without loss of generality. Not quite, so I put it in quotation marks. But um, you'll see a little bit on the first homework, which is going to come out this afternoon, by the way. Um, you know a little bit about how if you have a search problem you want to so solve, you can sometimes or often transform it to a decision problem, which is sort of equally easy or equally hard. So decision problems will be our, mostly our main focus. And one thing I want to remind you of, this is something that uh, you saw I think in 251, is just another way to uh, think about decision problems. It's very similar, or it's exactly similar, it's equivalent, and that says languages. So honestly, I don't know why people didn't just like stick with decision problems. It's a simple enough concept, but they also invented this equivalent thing called languages. And so you, since you'll see it everywhere, I'll remind you or tell you about that. So uh, a language is just a subset of strings. OK, so it's any subset of all the strings. Most often, it's an infinite subset. Uh, I'll give you an example. And I'll do, at the same time, an, an example that shows how it's equivalent to decision problems. So last time, we had an example decision problem uh, is prime. And this was like a function that um, you know, mapped strings into no or yes and had the you know, the behavior that um, you know, it, it output yes if it had the encoding of a prime number, and it's supposed to output no if it's the encoding of a non-prime number. And this is equivalent to a language, uh, which I'll call primes, or L, which is just the set of all encodings of prime numbers. Okay, so in general, if you have a decision problem, the associated language is just the set of all strings where the answer is yes. Okay. So you can easily go back and forth between them. I'll write that a bit more explicitly.
explicitly. So in general, you know, if you have some decision problem, f mapping strings into no and yes, um, then it goes to the language l instead of all strings where the answer is yes. Okay, and conversely, you have the reverse direction too, like given a language L, you can consider the decision problem F defined by F of X is supposed to be yes if X is in L and no if it's not. So these are really the exact same concept, just phrased in different ways, but for some odd reason uh, in complexity theory and computability people theory, people often got talking about uh, languages instead of decision problems. So the, they'll often talk about an algorithm like solving or deciding a language and that just means it should accept all the strings or say yes on all the strings that are in the language and say no on all the strings that are not in the language. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so let's move on to the main topic of the lecture which is how to formalize the notion of an algorithm. Again, this is something that was talked about a lot in, let's say, 251, but I'll talk about it a little bit again. So in some sense, I mean, it's, you know, these days it's not like so hard to think about this concept. I mean, you just need to like fix some like language for expressing algorithms. So basically like, you know, formalizing algorithms is really just like picking like a programming language and saying like, okay, this is going to be our, you know, official programming language for describing algorithms. And, you know, when you think about it this way, you have like many different uh, choices. So like, um, you know, you could say I'm going to use Python or C or C++ or Java or Haskell or whatever. There are like many like esoteric programming languages. I mean, there's like a thousand programming languages that you could you know, choose from. And, uh, you know, these are ones, all ones that like people actually use and probably you're familiar with one or more of them quite well. So in some sense, you know, we could choose one of uh, these to be our official, you know, uh, formalization of algorithms. Uh, but there's some issues with doing that, uh, as we'll see. I mean, uh, there are pros and cons. Um, and usually when it comes down to uh, computation theory, we don't choose a, a language like this. We instead, um, you know, choose something that's a, little, a lot more simple and easy to formalize, but therefore also annoying. Um, so, you know, uh, Turing invented this thing called Turing machines. And like a church at the same time invented this thing called untyped lambda calculus. And at the same time, this guy, Emil Post, invented something called, you know, basically post machines. These, like, all happened simultaneously and, like, independently in 1936. And then, you know, people, you know, invented further such things like Wong machines in, like, the 50s. And, like, some P prime prime in, like, 64. And, um... One thing I want to emphasize here is like all these things have like, or these things have the word like machine in them, but it's a bit uh, confusing. Maybe don't think of them as machines so much. I mean, you should really think of all these as like programming languages, like very esoteric, annoying programming languages, despite the fact that they're called machines. In fact, the one reason I mentioned this Wong machines thing is he was sort of one of the first people to think of it more as like a programming language than as actually a physical device. Um, so these are also all ways you can formalize algorithms and uh, you know, I put them into two kind of categories here because they have their pros and cons. So like on the left, I would say the pros over here are that like, you know, these ones are kind of fun to program in. 
And the colon, though, is it's like hard to mathematically formalize. So if you're like, what is the definition of the C programming language? You know, you know, ISO like has this 900-page PDF that defines like what is C, and like you know, for Haskell, there's like some 300-page PDF that defines you know what is that. Python, there's nothing. There's just an implementation. So it's very hard to actually um, formalize them. And if you want to rigorously prove things about uh, this programming language, it's very hard. On the other hand, uh, over here, the pros and cons are like literally exactly the opposite. So the con is that it's like horribly unfun to program in them. But like the pro is that it's, it's very easy, well, pretty easy to formalize them. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, uh, we're going to choose, you know, it's a, a mathy class. We're going to choose, uh, let's say, Turing machines as our official uh, notion of a uh, programming language as an algorithm uh, definition. And we're just going to have to deal with the fact that it's annoying to program in them. Um, but of course, you know, one major thing that was talked about a lot also in 251 is you might wonder, does it make a difference which one we choose? I mean, perhaps there's some things you can do in one pro with one programming language, one notion of algorithm, which you cannot do with another notion of algorithm. And uh, it's a fact that like all the things mentioned here, all the explicitly named mentioned things here, um, do not have this problem. They're all equivalent in terms of what they can compute, which decision problems they can solve. OK, and this is, uh, for these, it's like an empirical fact. Or you could probably literally prove it for if the programming language on the left that you cared about was simple enough. Turing himself proved the, the top two are equivalent in 1936. Um, this is all expression of something that's called the Church-Turing thesis, which is not a theorem or anything. It's just a thesis. And it's you know, a little hard to explicitly state, but you can say something like any, let's see, how did I say it? Any real world algorithm, whatever that means, can be simulated by, or maybe you should equally well think of it as compiled to uh, Turing machines. Again, I want to like emphasize a little bit that despite the name, you should think of Turing machines as like a programming language. This is like any problem, you know, any you know code that you write in Python or C or Java or whatever for solving a decision problem, you can make an equivalent Turing machine program that does the same thing. So uh, this is great. I mean, it, it seems to be true as far as we know. And so, in some sense, if you just care about what can be computed, it means it doesn't matter which language you choose. So maybe you should choose like the simplest one that's most easy to formulate mathematically so that you can try to prove some things. You know, another way to say this is that, you know, the notion of computable, whatever that means, is equivalent to computable by Turing machines. Um, Actually, there's one small thing I want to emphasize here before following up on this point, uh, which is the following. Um, there's one thing, aspect of Turing machines that maybe is, or, or this notion that's a little bit physically unrealistic, but I think it's mathematically natural, which is that, um, you know, we assume that algorithms can take an input of any length. So the input can be a string of any length, and that's sort of mathematically natural. I mean, it doesn't really make sense to say, like, well, algorithms only have to deal with inputs of length a million. Um, but on the other hand, it means that, like, whatever is doing this computing process has to be prepared to take an arbitrarily large uh, input, which maybe is not physically possible, but it's mathematically natural. And therefore, you have to assume that the, the algorithm has access to arbitrarily much memory. And that's what we'll do. Um, so maybe that's something that one is a little bit unused to if you're thinking about programming in, like, let's say, C. Um, you know, you should imagine C with, like, no upper bound on, like, memory usage. You can just keep using as much memory as you want. Okay. 
Uh, so let me go back to this statement here, this church Turing thesis that says, you know, if you don't, uh, if you're just interested in what problems can be solved by algorithms, it doesn't matter what programming language you choose as long as you choose something that's at least as powerful as a Turing machine. Well, that's all very well and good um, if you're studying computability. But as I you know, said last time, you know, this class is about complexity theory, which is about the efficiency of algorithms. So you know, once we decide and understand what can be computed by algorithms, the question that we care even more about, and which is the subject of this class, is like, you know, what um, problems can be solved by algorithms efficiently. And this church Turing thesis doesn't say anything about efficiency. It just says like, it's always possible to take a program written in Python and like, make an equivalent program in terms of uh, Turing machines. Well, it's equivalent in terms of you know, having the same input-output behavior, but it's not clear that it has the same efficiency or even related efficiency. Now, uh, as it happens, nevertheless, if you, you know, decide to try to always make everything a Turing machine, it's not too bad for efficiency. It's not like amazing or anything, but it's OK. Um, so here is a, a fact. Uh, I'll just tell it to you. Later, actually, we're going to prove things somewhat rigorously that are similar to this fact. But I'll just tell you this fact. Um, you know, an algorithm uh, running, let's say, yeah, running in time t uh, in C-like pseudocode. And all of this you know, fact should be in quotation marks because I'm not actually defining anything very formally. But yeah, let me just interject here to say that like, in the end, like, eventually when you study algorithms, and even in this class, when you describe an algorithm, we're eventually not going like, to you know, give a Turing machine. We're going to just you know, write some pseudocode in some like, very basic pseudocode, maybe C-like language or whatever, algol-like language. Uh, and then you know, we're going to roughly measure its running time by trying to count the number of steps it does. So uh, sort of what I'm talking about here. And the algorithm that you, you know, write some nice pseudocode and you say, oh, it runs in time t, it seems, in this model, um, you know, can be compiled to a Turing machine, sort of Turing machine code uh, running in time. Well, since everything here is in quotation marks, I'll just say about t to the power of 4. OK, so that's a bit what I was, like what I was saying when I said the efficiency is OK. One thing you can say is that you know, if you write some algorithm in like pseudocode and you prove that it runs in polynomial time, I'll remind you of what all this means later, but hopefully you've seen it a little bit before. If it runs in polynomial time in you know, pseudocode, then it runs in polynomial time. You can make an algorithm that runs in polynomial time on a Turing machine. You know, the polynomial goes up by a factor of 4, which is not very good. but at least it shows that the notion of polynomial time for these things like uh, you know, C and Java and so forth is the same even as polynomial time on Turing machines. So that's even more reassuring when you, you decide to make sort of our Turing machine our default model or our basic mathematical model for computation. You know, it illustrates that it doesn't even affect the notion of polynomial time. Now, uh, any questions about that, by the way? Yeah. Is the C like pseudocode to the RAM model? Okay, so yeah, later in the course, um, you know, algorithms people, uh, researchers, even like really formally define like a pseudocode kind of thing with like random access and you know ifs and loops and stuff, called the RAM model, and I've even mentioned it in some 251 classes, and um, yeah, you can prove like an actual rigorous theorem like this. The hardest part is, well, one of the harder parts is defining what exactly is the C-like pseudocode, which they may call the RAM model. But you can do it, and then this could become an actual theorem. Any other questions? Yeah? So, it's, so uh, I don't know, in the process of doing this, do you sort of translate assembly-level instructions into what, uh, I don't know, Turing machine uh, instructions? Yeah, we're even going to talk about these kinds of issues, I think, in the next class, sort of translating between models. But you can think about it like, you know, first you take this 
see like pseudocode and show that you can like maybe put it into like a pretty formal random instruction, random access machine model, and then uh, maybe you show that you can take language or sorry algorithms written in that model and convert them to like multi-tape Turing machines at a quadratic slowdown, and then you show that multi-tape Turing machines can be converted into single-tape Turing machines with like another quadratic slowdown and stuff like that. So yeah, actually next time we'll talk, uh, I think, a little bit about, you know, simulations between different models. And, you know, today we're just going to basically introduce one model, the simplest model, the one-tape Turing machine, and sort of get focused on that. It's a good question. More questions? So let me say one more thing on this topic. Um, you could similarly ask if this feature seems to be true about like every reasonable or real world, whatever this means, uh, programming language you could think of. And there is something called the uh, extended church Turing thesis. It says like any real world algorithm can be simulated by Turing machines with at most, polynomial slowdown. Which is kind of even better because, you know, if you believe this thesis, because it, you know, says that at least if you only care about the difference between polynomial time and not polynomial time, as opposed to more fine differences like linear time versus quadratic time, then still it doesn't matter like what language you pick to formalize algorithms. It's, it's okay to pick Turing machines. And um, for a long time, this seemed to be true. It still seems to be more or less true, uh, except for one thing, which is that quantum computers seem to actually falsify maybe this thesis. So we're not going to talk about quantum computation in this class, but it's the one thing, quantum computers, which seem to be like doable in the real world, yet which cannot be simulated uh, with polynomial efficiency in any of these languages. Okay, so that's a little bit to pique your interest, but for all these you know, languages I've talked about, this, this extended church Turing thesis holds true. Okay, so with all that said, this is all a bit to convince you that it's sort of okay for the purposes of studying computation and even computational complexity to focus on the Turing machine. And as I said, we do this because it's like simple enough that you can actually rigorously define it and prove things about it. Now, I should also add that like every time like a you know, person like teaches about Turing machines, they always feel like some angst uh, because it's very annoying. So like Turing machines, as I said, it's like a programming language and it's like the most like, it's super, super, super simple so that you can analyze it, but like it's the most like annoying, like painful esoteric programming language and like every time you like define it rigorously, you're like, man, is it really worth like all our time to like teach this like ridiculous programming language and like start coding stuff in it. And eventually you're like, well, I guess we got to do it because, you know, you have to actually sort of convince yourself that you can like formally define computation and formally talk about running times and stuff. Uh, but eventually we kind of want to get away from the low level details, but not today. So today we're going to do it. So as I said, you know, our official model for this course of algorithms is the Turing machine. And there's even some qualifiers here. Uh, it's, I'll put them in parentheses. It's the one tape Turing machine. I'll remind you what this means. And also, I'll put in an adjective here, two-way infinite Turing machine. Okay, but this is the main part. And I guess you've all seen Turing machines before in 251. Uh, so I'll sort of assume you remember them a little bit. And I'll start by trying to draw a picture. So the Turing machine, you know, it's, a, it's an algorithm. So it has access to this thing called the tape, which is just like an array. It's like a memory array, which is divided into cells. OK. And uh, 
I decided that our Turing machines are going to have uh, tates that are extend infinitely in both directions. That's a little unusual. Like in, in actual computers, you imagine there's like a memory cell number 0 and 1 and 2, and it goes up. But for whatever reason, I prefer to have it go both ways. SIPSER, the textbook, doesn't do that. SIPSER has a one-way infinite tape. So this will be like one departure between us and SIPSER. Sorry about that, but I prefer it this way. It's not going to be a big deal, as it turns out. OK, so this is called the tape. Or you can think of it as just like the big array of memory that the algorithm has access to. And each tape square can hold a symbol. in some alphabet. Okay. And um, you know, I still have this picture up here. So like the input to this algorithm comes in written on the tape. So like the input, let, maybe it looks like this. If the input is the string 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, then we just assume that's written on the tape or written into the memory at the beginning. And then this Turing machine has some kind of control. Just this thing that's like it's often drawn with these circles and the arrows, and it looks like a DFA or whatever. Um, but anyway, this control also has a head, which is like drawn as this arrow. And you can think of this as like the read write pointer into memory. And this control, I really prefer to think of it as like the source code. So this is like, this is like the main stuff. It's like the, this is where you write your algorithm into this control, like the instructions for how the algorithm operates. And the, you have like this very limited sort of set of instructions, um, you know, basically that cause this read write pointer, the head to like move left and right on the tape. And you can kind of read what character is written into this cell. And based on that, you can like go to a different line number in your source. These line numbers are called states. And you can also write the different symbol to the cell there. And you can go back and forth until you, the code halts. So you all like remember this a little bit? Great. Um, OK. So I'm going to show you some, I'm going to, on the computer, show you some examples here. but. Uh, let me say a few more things. So the control, or as I like to call it, the code, has states, uh, which are like line numbers, if you will, if you ever programmed in a language with line numbers. OK? And you know, maybe for some odd reason, like Turing maybe decided to like often start them with Q or name them after the letter Q. So you'll see like states whose names are like Q sub 0 or like Q sub 1. Or sometimes people get descriptive like Q sub go right or Q sub accept or whatever. So the source code has like a bunch of states, which you can think of as like line numbers. And mainly the, the source code is like a table. That's how you should think of it. You know, sometimes they like to draw it with the circles and stuff, but maybe in this class, I'll say, just think about it as like a table. And the source code will look like this. I have like a state and like symbol being red. And then like new symbol. These are the table headings. New symbol and the direction and like new state. OK, and so uh, let's say these actually happen to be the states that you chose for your algorithm, your Turing machine algorithm. Um, then the lines, you'll have like one line for each state and for each symbol that can be on the tape. So you'll be like, well, uh, if I'm in states Q0 and I'm reading symbol 0, then my instruction is maybe write a new symbol, which is 1. And then direction is left or right. So that means move the tape head or the pointer left or right. And then this is like jump to state Q1, maybe. This is like a hypothetical example. I don't even know what this code is going to do. Um, as I said, for every state and every symbol you might be reading, you need to have a row. 
So maybe if you see a 1 in state 0, you still write a 1, but this time you go right. And then maybe you go to some state called Q, go right. And one thing I forgot to mention is that um, all these empty cells, the count, we think of that as holding a symbol, the blank symbol. Okay, so this holds a 1, this is a 0, this guy's holding a blank. So usually we write like blank like this. Okay, so you can imagine in your head, we usually don't draw them, but like these all hold blanks. And it's perfectly fine for this read-write head to like, you know, walk onto tape cells that are memory cells that have blanks in them. So in particular, that means we also even need a row for like what to do if you're in state Q0 and you see the blank. You know, maybe in this case you write a zero. You can also write a blank if you want, that's fine. Move right, maybe you go to Q accept, I don't know. Okay, and then maybe we're done for Q0. So now we need to say what's happening if we're in state or line number Q1. If you read a zero, maybe you write a blank, and maybe you go left, and maybe you go to Q1, or something like that. <coughs> okay, so the main you know, work uh, when defining a Turing machine is writing out this like source code, this like table of like for every state that you could be in, and every symbol you could be reading, what new symbol to write, what direction to go, and what new state to jump to. And uh, you also have to specify the, separately, like the starting state. Oh, you'll do that. Maybe it's Q0 in this case. So really, I, I want to emphasize a little bit that you should think of it as like a, really a, like a weird esoteric programming language. Okay, and each like Turing machine is actually like some code. I won't take questions now because I'm going to do an example uh, on the computer uh, of a Turing machine whose goal in life is to uh, decide if the input string is a palindrome. This is always more, everybody's like, well, not everybody's favorite, but uh, a classic example. This is the language palindromes, which means all the strings that are the same if you reverse them. Okay, so the empty string, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, etc. All the strings that are the same if you reverse them. Okay, this is like a basic algorithms problem you might want to solve for some bizarre reason. You're given a string, you want to know if it's the same as the reversal of this string. And I will now show you a Turing machine that solves this problem. Okay, so uh, there's a couple of websites that let you like simulate Turing machines. This is the one that I found that I like the best. It's like a made by this perfect person called Morfet. And, right, so this is some code I wrote for a Turing machine that solved it. Uh, so, uh, it has its own like, you know, format for like writing this table, uh, but it's pretty much exactly like what I wrote here. Let me put it back up. Uh, it looks like a bunch of rows with five columns. Um, you're allowed to name the states anything you want, and like, you know, they don't have to start with Q, so, uh, I gave them like hopefully understandable names, like read leftmost, go right for zero, et cetera. And you know, you can go to this website and like type in some code and like put like an input on the tape and like step through it and like watch it execute. So this is what we'll do. Um, at a high level, let me describe how this algorithm is gonna work, uh, like in words. Um, what it's gonna do is, you know, it starts out like reading this input and the first thing it'll do is look to see if it's a zero, a one, or a blank. And if it's a blank, that means the input is empty. So it can just stop and say, yes, it's a palindrome. Otherwise, it's a zero or a one. And so it's gonna like remember if it's a zero or one by sort of going to different states. Like if it sees a zero, it'll go to like some state that's designed to check if there's a zero at the end of the string. And if it goes to, if it reads a one, it'll go to a different state that's designed to check if there's a one at the end of the string. And once it reads this first symbol, it's going to overwrite it with a blank. So it kind of is like, I'm done with that symbol. And then it'll go into some state that'll just say, whatever you read, write it back and keep going right. And keep doing that until you read a blank. And then you know you've hit the end. And then replace that blank with a blank and go back one left. And now you're at the last symbol in the string. And you also sort of in your state of remembered if you're supposed to be checking if it's a zero or a one. 
So then indeed check if you're reading the matching symbol, 0 or 1. And if you're not, then you can say, no, it wasn't a palindrome. But if you are reading a matching symbol to the one that you remember from the beginning, then you're happy. Write a blank on top of it. Go into like a little loop that walks left now until you reach a blank. And then you know you've got to the left of the end of the string. And then like go back one and sort of repeat again. So you know, check what this is and try to match it with the character at the end. And always, like, as long as everything is successful, overwrite the beginning and last characters with blanks to kind of know that you've got them. And then keep going until you either find a mismatch or if you kind of, everything looks cool and like you have like blanks everywhere, then you know it was a palindrome. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, now let's, let's look at it for a little bit, at least. So, uh, this Turing machine I wrote has, I think, let's see, one, two, three, four, Four, five states up there, but there's more. Six states, seven states. So it has seven main states. Uh, They're shown in that column on the left. It also kind of has two more states, one called halt accept and one called halt reject. Um, in Turing machines, like you have two special states, halt reject and halt accept. And like they, once you hit those states, everything ends. So you don't have to, you don't have to have like rows for them in this table because once you get to those halt states, you just stop. So you don't need to say what happens. And in this particular, like, you know, Turing machine simulator, any state whose first four characters are H-A-L-T is counts as a halt state. So you don't have to, like, specify which are the halting states. It sort of automatically knows it. And also this first line in the source code here is kind of special because it uh, somehow this designates that read leftmost is, like, the initial state. So, uh, yeah, I'll just step through it a little bit here and show you what happens. So my input here is 1001, which is a palindrome. So let's see what happens. Hopefully this will work. I can never get the, oh, for God's sakes. I have a lot of problems with getting the wireless to work. So I'm actually going to connect to edgy roam like a sucker. <laughs> let's see if it works now. Ah, OK, great. So basically, the first thing that happens is you start in this state, read leftmost. And it's highlighting blue because the head is reading a one. Okay. And now the instruction is underscore is blank in this program. Write a blank, move to the right, and then go to state called go right for one. So you see how we're remembering the name of the state is kind of encoding like what we're looking for at the end of the string. So great. So it's going to, at the top there on the tape, it's going to overwrite that one with a blank and jump to go right for one. Aha. OK, so now we're in this uh, line, go right for one, and the head is on a zero. So it's going to write a zero, so basically leave it alone, do nothing, go right. And then it's going to go back to the same state, go right for one. So this is like a little loop where it's just traveling along the tape towards the right. And it's gonna, as you can see, this line does the same thing. So it's going to keep going until it hits a blank, and then it's going to do something interesting. Uh, all right, hopefully. Oh, good, yeah. Good. OK, and now the head's hitting a blank. So it's still going to write in a blank, but then it's going to go left, which will put it at the 1, and it's going to go into the new state, check for 1. And you see, like, if it was in the go right for 0, it would go to the check for 0 state, but here it's going to the check for 1 state. So let's do this. OK, that's down here. And, you know, check for 1. You see, if you're in this state and you see a 0, then you're going to go to the halt reject state. That's like the algorithm output, like, nope, it's not a palindrome. Because it like, saw a 1 at the beginning, but a 0 at the end. And you know, you're obliged to put something here. So I said, you know, write a blank and go left. But it doesn't really matter. I could have put anything there, because anyway, it's going to halt and reject. But anyway, in this case, it actually sees a 1. So that's good. So it's going to put a blank there to sort of check it off, like that's done. And then it's going to go left. And it's going to go to the state called start going left. And start going left is actually a bit of a funny state. You see, basically, no matter what it sees, it's going to just write that same character back. Um, and then it's going to, if it sees a 0 or 1, it'll go to this other state called go left till blank. But if it sees a blank, it'll halt and accept. 
And when I was first writing the code for this, like I didn't have this state. I was just like, okay, at this point you can do a loop that like starts walking to the left, like this go left till blank. But there's like some edge case there that like you have to think about. Like somehow, for example, if the input string is of length two, then this would actually happen, and you have to like realize that you should accept now and not start going left. So as always in programming, like you have to think about the little uh, edge cases that could mess you up. And so that's why like there's sort of two states that are about traveling to the left. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that much more. Um, right, so this is like a, sort of a looping state where whatever you read, you just write it back, you go left, and you keep going until you're reading a blank. And what's cool is once you read a blank, you get back to the left edge of the string, uh, you write the blank back, and you go right, and then you can actually go all the way back to that initial state we started in, like read leftmost. It's like we finally hit the end of like the giant loop that like, you know, we can take back ourselves back to the top and sort of recursively kind of start the whole thing again. So it's going to keep going left. Oh, I got there. Great. And now it's going to do the whole loop again. It reads a zero. It's going to remember that, go to the right, which is not very far away. Come back, check that it indeed is a zero there. Oh, and here, actually, we're going to use the start going left state. I think you need this for even length strings, actually. And now it's like, I checked everything off. I didn't see anything mistaken, so I'm done and I'll halt, and I'll accept. Okay, so finally, the algorithm correctly checked that this was a palindrome. And it's, this also has like, the pleasant feature that at the end, like, the tape is left blank. But you don't have to do that. It doesn't matter how you leave the tape. Um, you just have to get the right answer. OK, so any questions about that? Let's just try a little bit more, I mean, since Got it up here. <laughs> let's let's do an example where it fails. One one zero zero one zero one one. That's not a palindrome. So resets. Yeah, let's go. Like so yeah, you can you can try it. And it got almost. I mean, I, I did it like that way so that it would run for a while. You see, it got almost all the way, but at the very end, in the middle, it noticed that there was some problem. So actually, let's make one where like. It stopped halfway through. So, so far, that's a palindrome. But, like, let's mess it up somewhere in here. Yeah, great. <laughs> yep. Well, we could just do this for the rest of the class. <laughs> hey, I noticed that it wasn't great. Let me just do one more illustration. <laughs> This is a very long string, which is a palindrome. And one thing you can notice is that this is not like the most efficient algorithm in the world, right? So you can see that when it actually is a palindrome, basically it's going to go all the way across and all the way back and all the way across and all the way back. Granted, it'll get like shorter by like one or two characters each time you do that, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, and in particular, if the string is n characters long, and this will do a number of steps. You can see we're up to 500 steps now. That's something like n, maybe 2n plus 2n minus 1 plus 2 times n minus 2. Anyway, something like order of n squared, which is quite uh, slow because if you wrote like, I don't know, a C program to check if a string is a palindrome, you'd have a pointer at the beginning and a pointer at the end. And you just check if they're the same. And then you'd like move the pointers inwards, always checking if they're the same. And you'd be like, well, that took about order n steps. Whereas this algorithm is taking order n squared steps. So it's an example of where you know, the, the Turing machine code is somewhat slower than you feel it should be. But on the other hand, by only a polynomial amount. So this is like a quadratic time algorithm. Whereas like in a different, maybe more realistic model, it would be a linear time algorithm. Oh, and it's done. Great. Wonderful. OK. How exciting. OK, so good. Any questions about Turing machines? And if you can't think of any now, you'll have more opportunity, because the next thing we're going to do is define Turing machines. So so far, I've just given you some examples. But in some sense, the whole point of you know, Turing machines is that you can define them totally rigorously, even though it's like a little painful and not clear how much value you get in life out of doing it, but let's do it. Yeah. Turing 
It's actually the second one. It's a great question. So in the, in the 30s and 20s, people, well, first of all, there weren't like physical computers. They only had like human computers. And um, yeah, they were really struggling with, they didn't have programming languages, this notion of like what is computing, what is an algorithm. And you know, Gödel had a suggestion, which he didn't really like. It was very mathematical. And like Church had a suggestion, which was this like untyped lambda calculus. And Church was like, I think this should be the definition of algorithm. And everybody's like, uh, I don't know. And then Post had a definition, but like he was kind of shy and like he didn't publish it because he didn't think it was complete yet, even though it was really good. So he didn't get any credit. Um, but like Turing wrote a paper that was like just about the question, like how should we define algorithms? And it was like an amazing paper. If you haven't read it, you should definitely read it. It's really great. Um, and he really spends a lot of time thinking, like phil describing philosophically and like physically. I mean, he really thought about physics. And in fact, he went on also to physically build computers, like what it means to do computation. He has like this great like discussion of like a thought experiment of like a human computer, like computing something and how like that human could be like simulated by a tape and like he talks about like well you know we should only allow finitely many symbols because like a human eye could like physically only literally distinguish a finite number of different objects and things um, and the control should be finite because like the human's brain is like you know got like a finite amount of stuff in it um, so he really discussed really a lot why he thought this was like a good definition for computing or algorithms and it's just very compelling. And everybody that read the paper, like in the 30s, were like, yeah, great argument. Like, you did it. Um, and he also proved that, like, it could simulate lambda calculus. And I think vice versa. So he kind of gave the first kind of illustration of the, what became the church Turing thesis that, you know, sort of showed that all the natural computational models were equivalent to Turing machines. And then when people actually invented computers and, like, algorithm programming languages and stuff, you know, they came to see that you could compile them all to Turing machines. So they kind of gained confidence in the church Turing thesis that way. Yeah, great question. Okay, well, on to more mathematical things. Uh, this, uh, these things are all, let's say, from Turing's paper in 1936, except he called them A machines instead of Turing machines. Okay, so here we go. Uh, definition, a Turing machine consists of the following multitude of objects. Q, for some reason, a finite set of states. Okay, so this is the thing that like in our example, you know, there was, you know, I'll call it Q sub, you know, go left or whatever, and uh, whatever, Q accept and so forth. And sigma, which is an input alphabet. Now I have to say a little bit about this. So Turing machines, in there are examples like this was 0, 1. Turing machines, you know, they're supposed to operate on input strings. And sigma is the alphabet that the input strings are written in. But Turing machines allow you, and this is necessary, to use more symbols on the tape than uh, could be in the input. And you always have to have like one extra symbol, at least, blank, because, I mean, otherwise, you know, the, the Turing machine can't tell, like, you know, what is, where does the input stop or end, okay? So, I mean, just to have, like, the property of you can write the input in the input alphabet, but then everything else is blank, so the machine can understand what the input is, requires you to have more symbols. But in fact, and I'll show you examples later, you're also allowed, if you want, to just have even more symbols. That's fine. Um, so a Turing machine has two alphabets actually associated with it. The other one is, for some reason, called gamma. This is called the tape alphabet. OK, so gamma should have the following properties. It should contain all of the input symbols. And it should also contain the blank symbol. That's blank. And it also can have more symbols if you want. OK. You know, it's an alphabet, so it can only have finitely many symbols. But you can have more if you want. And of course, you know, this is super technical, but blank should not be in the input alphabet. Okay, so the most common case is that just the input alphabet is 0 and 1, 
And the tape alphabet is often just you know, 0, 1, and blank. But sometimes you're designing an algorithm, you can use whatever symbols you want. So you'll throw in like some punctuation symbol, like that hash, or maybe you'll throw in an X or something, just you know, stuff to help you. Uh, OK. Uh, another technicality, which is so technically lame, I'm not even going to write it. The names of the alphabet symbols should be different from the names of the states. I can't believe I even said that. <laughs> uh, OK. And another thing that you need to specify your Turing machine is the initial state, which is just one of the states. She's usually written Q0 in Q. You know, that's just like, you know, we saw it on the simulator, right? You've got to tell it what state to start in. That's sort of obvious. And you also need, this is a very long definition. You also have to tell it the halting states, like, you know, the states that will cause it to stop running. So you also have to specify and uh, the accept state. Q this. And also the reject state. Q reject. This is also a little ridiculous, but I'll write it. These should be different states. OK, so this is all like the sort of ancillary stuff. Now like the main part is the code, you know, that big table. So the mathematicians usually call this the transition function. And this is how you'll see it in Sipser. I really like to just think of it as like the code or that table of instructions. But you see what the table really is, if it's still up here, hopefully. Mm. Aha. It's a mapping from each pair, a state and a symbol, to a triple, a new symbol, a direction, and a new state. So it's really like a function that maps you know, the entries on the left to the entries on the right. So the mathematically, you can call it a function. Q times uh, gamma, because it, it's reading a tape symbol, to gamma cross either left or right cross Q. Okay, so the mathematical way to say that it takes in a state and a tape symbol and outputs a tape symbol, left or right, or a symbol. Actually, this is not quite right. Uh, even Sipser like, does not clarify this point in his book until like, later in the text. But you know, we don't write any rows for the accept and reject state. Because once you get to those states, you just stop. So really, there's no transitions or changes once you hit those. So let me say Q prime. Or Q prime is all the states, but not the accept or reject state. Okay, so maybe mathematically, that's the end of the definition. Like, Turing machine consists of specifying all these components. Yeah? Uh, yeah, in the first part of that function, shouldn't it be with Q prime uh, cross Sigma or Great question. The question is here, should this have been sigma? And uh, the answer is that it should be um, gamma, because although it's true at the beginning, the Turing machine, let's say at the very first step, will only be reading a, a symbol that's in the input alphabet, sigma. As it goes along, like it may encounter a blank. And it may encounter a symbol that's already written. And it's allowed to write symbols that are in gamma. So eventually, after a while, it can start seeing things in gamma. But good question, yeah. OK. Any questions about this definition? Uh, right. Now, for example, let me ask you a question. Uh, I said that like in our official model, we're going to have a two-way tape like that's infinite in both directions. But I also told you that like in Sipser's, you know, he defines it slightly differently. You know, there are many slight variants in Turing machines. He defines it to have a one-way infinite tape like with a left edge. So where does that difference show up in our definitions? 
Yeah. Like, when you move to the left or right, you have to like account for when you hit the edge case, basically. Yeah, that's the difference in like how they act. Well, as for the question of like where the difference shows up in like our formal definitions, the answer is it hasn't shown up yet. So we're only halfway done. Uh, it's kind of like we defined the syntax of Turing machine programming language, but we didn't define the semantics. We defined like what valid Turing machine code looks like, but we did not define like how it actually operates. So we have to do that too. Okay, and this is where the difference between like what the tape looks like will come in. So, even though like, you know, I showed you these examples, you kind of like know, right? I mean, once I give you the Turing machine, like, I think you and I both know how it operates, but if we're really being formal, we should write that too. So, I guess we'll do it. And actually, this, one of the main reasons I went through all this is uh, to define how a Turing machine operates, you have to define something called a configuration. And this turns out to actually be a genuinely important concept for many of the things we'll do later in this course in terms of understanding things like NP-completeness and the relationship between space and time. These are big things that we're going to look at, and they rely on this technical definition, which is going to arise now, called configuration. So this is actually somewhat important, although so far it seems just like you know, defining complicated things for, I don't know, mathematics sake. So in order to describe like how a Turing machine, how a Turing machine algorithm computes, you have to kind of you know, explain how things happen as it goes along. And in order, you know, informally to understand how things happen as it goes along, basically you need to keep track of three things in the computation. You need to keep track of the tape contents. And you need to keep track of the head position. And you need to keep track of what state the Turing machine is in. Okay, if I tell you all the contents of the tape, all the, where the head is pointing, and what state the Turing machine is in, then you'd say like, yeah, okay, I got it. I can ex now start to explain what will happen next in the computation. And all of these three things together are called the configuration. I've also seen it called the instantaneous description. Well, it kind of describes at like one instant of time what, uh, how to describe the Turing machine, but we'll call it a configuration. And you can just represent it as a tuple, but actually there's a little trick that like um, Sipser and others introduce, which is representing it as a string, which I quite like. So we're going to do that. We're going to like have a system for packaging all this information into a string. And let me give you an example. like an example over here. So let me just modify this example a little bit. Let's say, because this is like the beginning, but let's say it's been going along for a while and like somehow there is a zero here and a one here, but like the rest of them were blanks. And let's say it happened to be at this instant like in state Q3. Okay, so let's say we're computing along and the tape looks like this and the head pointer is here and the state is Q3. I'll just tell you, this is an example, I'll define things in a second, but I'll tell you, at this time, the configuration is the string, okay, I got to look at it here, 1, 0, blank, Q3, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so, uh, this is a string. It's a string whose alphabet, in this particular case, well, let's say in the general case, is the tape alphabet union the state names star. Okay, so this is a string where each symbol is either a tape symbol or the name of a state. And um, most of the characters are zeros and ones. There's one blank and there's also one symbol. This is like just one symbol called Q3, which is the name of a state. And how did I get this? Basically what you do is, there's a few details, but basically you write down the tape contents and you also stick in the name of the state that you're currently in and you stick that in just to the left of the, where the head is. Okay. 
it's just like one system for like simultaneously recording the tape contents and the uh, head position is sort of artificially encoded by like wherever the state symbol is, it's to the right, that's the head position, and also what state you're in. Yeah? Yeah, that's the technicality that I said I was only going to say in words and not write. <laughs> the ridiculous thing, uh, the state symbols and the, the tape symbols should have different names. Very sharp. Yeah. But if you encode it like using a tuple, technically you can have states that... That's right. So, um, nevertheless, I don't think it's too onerous to like say that the tape symbols and state symbols should be different. Actually, it's a little bit onerous because people often like to use uh, state names 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and they also like to use the tape symbols 0 and 1. So I'm like, call them Q0, Q1, Q2, or something. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of niceness in like being able to define configurations as strings. And for that reason, you know, I'm going to make people have different tape symbols and uh, state symbols. There's one like, other like, technicality, which is that like, it's a little bit funny. It's not too bad. But like, if you see this is the configuration, then the actual tape contents is this, with like, all blanks to the left and all blanks to the right. And like when you're making a configuration, you have to delete all the leading and trailing blanks, which is not the same as deleting all the blanks, because like, you know, this blank has to stay. But like once you get to the point where it's like all blanks from that point on, and the point where it's like all blanks from that point on, you delete those in like making the configuration. Uh, so it's a little bit technical, but like I think hopefully you'll get it. Like here's a simpler example. Here's the tape where like not much is happening. The only thing on the tape is one, and let's say that the head is here, and you're in the state Q4, and the configuration would be Q4, one. That's a string of length two. Whereas if the head were here, the configuration would be one Q4. Okay. And if the tape head were here, it would be one blank Q4. OK. So in general, I mean, I'll just write it. So you get the configuration. What you do, you take the tape contents, which is actually a two-way infinite string at the beginning. Insert the state as a symbol to the left of the head position. And then you trim the leading and trailing blanks. Now I'm going to actually ask you a question. Uh -huh. uh, which strings are valid configurations? Basically, two properties you need to have. So a string, if I just give you any old string in the appropriate alphabet, gamma union q star, is a valid configuration if, and only if, uh, what two things? One of them is pretty easy. Yeah? One of the, one of the cues must be new. Exactly, yeah. It has exactly, yeah, one symbol from Q. The other condition, it's a little bit more tricky, yeah? It can't begin or end with blanks. Exactly, yeah. It doesn't begin or end with blank. I won't exactly prove that this is uh, the exact characterization, but you should think about it for a little, and you'll see that, like, well, it's pretty clear that every string that is a configuration looks like this. You have to think for, like, one minute to understand why every string that looks like this is a valid configuration. Maybe 30 seconds. OK. So now, uh, having defined configurations, we have uh, all the definitions we need to define computation. 
So let's do that. That also requires a number of definitions. Um, great. So we first have to explain, OK, so we have to ex explain what happens when you're given a Turing machine algorithm m and an input x. We have to define how m, the operation of m computing on x. First thing we have to do is say how it starts. And so we just specify the initial configuration. So this is the definition of initial configuration. The initial configuration is, well, what should it be? I think we might actually need the last line here. Yeah, q0 followed by x. OK, good. we just specify that it starts out The strings written on the tape, blanks to the left and to the right, and the head is, you know, we define it as being positioned at the left end of the string. Okay, so in this notation here, Q0 is a symbol and X is a string of symbols. And so Q0X is a string of symbols of length one more than X's length. Okay, let me make one more basic definition about knowing when to stop. We say a configuration C is a halting configuration if it contains one of the two halting states. And these are symbols. Okay. And uh, finally, we come to the main part of the definition. Which defines you know, the semantics of Turing machine operation, like how you transform this, or how you look at these instructions, this table, and like say what the Turing machine does. So well, here it is. Given a non-halting configuration, Uh, C, we'll define like next config sub M of C to be the configuration C prime uh, defined as follows. Let me first write it informally. It's, you know, the next configuration you get when you do one step. Okay. In some sense, the whole point of this definition is that you can say what it is formally. I only have 11 minutes left and I want to do a little bit more. So even this is like the pin, this is like the acme of the whole thing. I'm not going to, I'll put it on Piazza. Uh, but like, perhaps you can imagine what it'll look like. I mean, to really define like how you get the string C prime from the string C, you say like, well, first you have to write C as like a string U followed by a symbol A, followed by a state Q, followed by a symbol B, followed by a string V. And then you like look at delta of Q comma B, because really in this, this is saying you're in state Q and the head is at B. So then you look at Q B and like say it's really I almost could just write it, but like let's say it's D L Q prime, you know, then C prime is and you know, you would write the string where you had a Q prime over here and this B changed to a D. Hey, in the interest of saving myself three minutes, I'll put it on Piazza. Um, but somehow the whole point is you can like formally just say like, here's how you take this string. And basically this is the source code, the definition of the Turing machine and syntactically produce the next 
string, which is the configuration of the Turing machine in the next step. Okay, so sorry for admitting that, but I want to make sure we end at an okay time. Okay. I should also add that Sipser does not use this notation. I just invented it. Next config. If you look at Sipser's book, he just says, uh, he uses the phrase yields. He says that C yields C prime. So we can say that too. OK, so let's assume we've made that uh, definition. And now we're almost done for defining computation. I'm going to say the computation trace of uh, m on input x is a sequence of configurations. C0, C1, C2, dot, 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 where, well, C0 is the initial configuration. Which, remember, we defined. I don't know if it's still up here, but it's Q0 followed by X. And, you know, C1 is next config sub M of C0. C2 is the next configuration of C1, etc. So the computation trace is just the sequence of configurations that the Turing machine gets itself into. Up until either you get a halting configuration. CT, that's one where it contains a state symbol which is either Q accept or Q reject. Or if you never get one, then forever. And this is an experience that I know you all have. I mean, if you write a, a program in a programming language and you run it on some input, it may just run forever. It might get into an infinite loop of some sort. And this can happen with Turing machine algorithms as well. And um, we hate it when this happens. We don't like to analyze really any algorithms if they don't always halt. We'll get to that. But let me continue this definition a little bit. In the former case, when it does halt, or hits a halting state, we say, you know, M halts on X. And we can also add accepts or rejects, because depending on whether it ended in Q accept or Q reject, in T steps, or sometimes time T. And let me add a little comment here. This is like one of the glorious aspects of Turing machines, is that it's extremely clear, like literally exactly how many steps it takes, how much time it takes. You know, if you're analyzing pseudocode, you know, it says, you know, if you write if array index at i equals 3, then do this. You're like, well, does that count as one time or two time or log time? In Turing machines, it's like 100% clear. There's no ambiguity. Like, it's the number of configurations until it halts the end. Okay, so that's another reason we really like Turing machines. Okay, and then in the latter case, we say that m loops. And as I mentioned, we really don't like when this happens. Okay, so this is the end of the definition. Maybe the end of all the definitions. Phew. Any questions? So now we defined like the syntax, the syntax of Turing machine algorithms. That was all this definition of a Turing machine. And we defined, except for some little bit I'll put on Piazza, the semantics, like how it operates, and what we mean by saying this algorithm M computing on this input X. 
OK, well, it's early days so I, in this course, so it's a lot of definitions. So I'm going to give some more. Uh, but these are ones you saw in 251. So we say that M is a decider if M on X halts for all X. OK? If, you know, it doesn't ever get into an infinite loop. We really, really don't like algorithms which are not deciders. Basically, we don't study them. Um, so assuming, well, it's a decider, this is the main, maybe this is the final definition. We say that M decides or solves a language L. Well, basically, if it gives the correct answer, the correct input-output behavior. But there's two things you should check. One, M should be a decider. If you like, you know, get into infinite loop on even one string, we don't like you. And then two, you actually get the right answer. So M of X halts and accepts for all X's that are in the language and rejects for all X's that are not in the language. OK, or if you think of it as a decision problem, for all the x's where the answer is yes, it's supposed to accept. And for all the x's where the answer is no, it's supposed to reject. So well, I'll turn the page and see what is here. But like, I think we finally defined everything. Like, We talked about inputs. We talked about Turing machines as algorithms. We talked about how they compute. And finally, what it means for them to solve problems. Let me say a couple more things. Uh, any questions, actually, though? Yeah? Uh, can Turing machines deal with randomness? Can Turing machines deal with randomness? Great question. Uh, the answer is yes, and wait till March <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Turing machines can deal with randomness. Um, actually, in one of two ways. You can just assume that Turing, the machine, has access to a separate tape that's filled with random bits. Or you can just say that, like, for each row, of the, the source code, you can uh, change it to two rows, giving two options for what it should do at each stage. And you can just imagine that it randomly chooses one. OK. So uh, actually, this is what it means for a Turing machine to solve a decision problem. Uh, I'll just even end with this remark. One nice thing about Turing machines that's, that's cool, we didn't talk about it much, is that you can also think of them as giving output. I mean, at the end of the time, the run, when they halt, there's some tape contents. And you can think of basically the tape contents as the outputs. So that's good. Now, nice. You can think of a Turing machine as being able to output strings as well, and thereby solve decision problems. Sorry, let's say function problems or search problems. So I'll end with this definition, maybe. Uh, M computes the so Turing machine, a function. Let's say from sigma star to sigma star, this might be a function problem, like given a string, uh, given a number, output its prime factorization. If for all strings, well, first of all, m should halt. And let's even, it doesn't really matter. If you care about its output string, it doesn't really matter if it accepts or rejects. But let's say it accepts. Uh, and it ends with the configuration, which is basically the answer. Configuration Q accepts followed by F of X. So again, this is a string. The first symbol is the accepting state's symbol name. And then this is a string, which is the answer. Okay, so Turing machines are also very convenient because they can solve the function and search problems too. OK, so if I had like five more minutes, which I don't, I was going to show you a couple of more example Turing machine runs on this, uh, the screen to illustrate things like using different tape symbols or giving output. But I'll also just also put those on Piazza, and you can check them out in your own time. Yeah? Does that have to be a decider as well? Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's implicit. But yeah, like M should be a decider. OK, I'll see you on Tuesday. and. Uh, there will be a homework coming out this afternoon, which you'll be able to find on the web page. <laughs>